Welcome to another episode of Spooky VD Clinic, <laughs> which that sounds like a whole kind of other horror. <laughs> yeah, you know, that chlamydia can get stupid, but spooky. <laughs> the syphilis when things start mm, falling off. <laughs> yeah, you know, all of a sudden your nose isn't there. <laughs> That's not ectoplasm. No, it's not. <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> Have we really defined it? <laughs> That's true. Hey. It could. Oh, <laughs> that's some Slimer fan fiction right there. Anyway, on another note, I am one of your hosts, Vanessa. With me, as always, <laughs> Darren. Say hello, Darren. <laughs> hello, everybody. And our special guest, Iris. Hello, Hi, Iris. everyone. Hello, hello. I'm so excited to be here. Well, I, you know, I'm excited to have you because I, I think we've recorded together once, and then other times I keep I keep brought in being brought into shows that you're on regularly <laughs> when you can't make it. So yeah. it's like I'm the Iris substitute. There you go. Hey, I'm not complaining, but and I've I mean, always well, wanted yeah. to have you on here. So <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I think we did uh, Vampiros Lesbos. Yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> that was so good. <laughs> yes, a lot of fun ages ago. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, Iris, do you want to tell everybody about what you do on a what podcast you do on a regular basis? Yeah, sure. So I am uh, regularly on BB and BC podcast. And uh, that's basically Mike Murphy, Mark Searing and myself. And we basically podcast about, uh, you know, cult classics, uh, grindhouse exploitation, drive in B movies. Uh, see if you want to take a listen to us, we are at exploitationfilm.com. And we re recently did uh, Pretty Maids All in a Row with Rock Hudson and Angie Dickinson, Tandelisa Wallace. It was just <laughs> amazing. Yep. Uh, and then we are going to be recording uh, the uh, Mystics of Bali next Saturday, which I am looking forward to very much. And then uh, I occasionally show up with Gary on the Cinnamon Beef podcast. And I'm actually recording tomorrow. We're going to be watching two giallos that I just finished watching, and I can't remember what they're called, <laughs> uh, which is typical for me because I always watch my movies at, you know, the last minute so I can remember what I'm talking about. Uh, so, yeah. Oh, yeah, here we go. It's um, Death Carries a Cane and So Sweet, So Dead. Those are going to be fun. And you can find uh, the Cinema Beef podcast at a uh, Legion uh, podcast. What what is it? You, you guys are Legion? Yeah, we're on Legion as well. Okay, yes. Okay, so you guys are on Legion too. So you can find them. You can find us there, and we do lots of fun stuff. Uh, Gary Hill and Suzanne and myself. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, occasionally, you know, the Theme Warriors. Uh, I think we're kind of like a little hiatus right now. It's kind of hard to get four people to have time on the same day in, I think, two different time zones. And it's just kind of hard. <laughs> but yeah, yeah so far, so good. Yeah, no, I, I, I understand completely. Like, 
even I, I will say during the, since the pandemic began, I feel like even Darren and I, just the two of us sometimes. It's just hard, isn't it? It's just things have gotten more complicated and we're, we've, we're not doing as many shows uh, as we did for a while. So, yeah. I understand. Oh yeah. It's the same with us. Um, you know, and you're doing <laughs> multiple shows. <laughs> I mean, Darren, One he case. has a, he has his own show too. I mean, oh wow, but, right on. So, yeah, more and... power to you, man. When you can do it, you can do it. <laughs> neither of them, this neither this nor the other one are weekly. I don't have it in me to try to do that. Oh no, man, no. <laughs> that that that's a lot of commitment. <laughs> Lots. Sure. But yeah, I'm excited to talk about this book. Yes, you know, it, well, every October, you know, we're spooky season people all year round, kind of. Yes. Anyway, um, as I know you are. <laughs> we just turn it up a bit on, you know, in October. Right, exactly. Um, no, I'm not going to... Uh, one horror movie every single week this month in the theater. Um, I promise I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> it's like somebody asked, uh, I think it was Robin from uh, We Saw the Devil. Mm -hmm. She posted, so when do you get ready for, you know, Halloween? Yeah. <laughs> I posted November 1st. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I mean, it's all year round, right? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Goth girls rule. <laughs> I know. My mom just got me a little mini um, skull waffle iron. Oh, and, how cute. You know, and perfect for a, you know, Brooklyn apartment <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> where you have you no storage. Exactly. It's just like <laughs> two feet of counters and that's it. Yep. That too. Anyway. So the, you know, I've kind of been wanting to change things up a little bit um, and get us into some different kinds of tales than we've heard in a while. And this time I wanted to go with kind of a theme of uh, Latinx, like, ghost stories for... Oh, yeah for our October and um, today we're talking about the 2020. We're doing a really recent book too. Yeah. Um, Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno Garcia. And then we are talking about Guillermo del Toro's The Devil's Backbone. So yeah, we, um, we true. I mean, it's they both, yeah, have these ghost elements, and so Mexican Gothic. Um, had any of you read this before, or was this your first read? This is the first read for me. Same. Um, okay. Although you've been talking about this <laughs> since at least the summer. <laughs> yeah, I well, it it came out last year, and she won all these awards for this book, and she um, she's Mexican. She's considered Me Mexican Canadian. She grew up in Mexico, but has. Her adopted home is Canada for oh. her, her adult life. And and so this is the author. And so she's been working in quite a lot of genre, like short stories, like editing, even like a, a Jewish Mexican literary review. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm like, that sounds awfully specific, but it I I don't know. Um, and 
there like one I, I, I read that one of the one of the editions of book or like short stories or whatever that she like published with this publishing company is a collection called fungi <laughs> that's interesting since mushroom plays such a big part in this uh yeah which is which is described as a collection of fungal fiction so mm. i find that and that was in 2013 so obviously seeing that and in, in this book it, it, there's there's something interesting there but i just i i was found that out when i was when i was reading a little about her but everything that she's written has been kind of or or been involved with editing wise and publishing wise has been this kind of genre these different genre things and um you, you know there there's it's some of it out of mexico but um you know some of it internationally and then this book the how i was became aware of it is it was voted the 2020 goodreads best horror novel really yeah so i read it in january of 2021 <laughs> yeah and it, as soon as i i found that out and then i've been i've been probably like who can i talk about this with ever since i read it <laughs> <laughs> and i guess we will if you listeners if you haven't read the book i would say we're gonna have to spoil some things i think yeah um so pause and come back later and <laughs> for the movie portion of the show but um yeah we do have to discuss a few things that are a little bit more spoilery i think to get into the nitty-gritty of this and uh, yeah this is i one thing that struck me with this is i mean the writing style but obviously but it was because it is such that so reminiscent of the traditional gothic kind of ghost story yeah the, the british ones the ones that are notoriously british okay? yeah withering heights and you know Val uh, the house of usher and things like that well even like henry james or oh, the turning and, of the screw it, that's what, right and even like um carmila mm -hmm. you know things like that that are just so British and this having the British characters in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It it lent it itself really very turns well. it on its head and having them as the colonizers, as the invaders, and as the negative. <laughs> Cause there is kind of there is not just kind of, there is that tone. <laughs> it's of very, very apparent. that condescension from the British people in here when they are dealing with the Mexican and indigenous people mm -hmm. of the region. Um, yeah, it's just wow. Uh, I, I mean, that's the first thing that strikes me about this. And I kind of, that was, that was, the, that was it's apparent pretty quickly but it really made me just it made it pulled me in very quickly i don't know what about you I, iris well i i totally got sucked in really quickly um especially with the tone of um you know a bit of a poish tone to it and 
I've been a huge poet, a, a, a huge Poe and Lovecraft fan. I think since I, I was introduced to it by my third grade teacher. Well, and, and, and let me interrupt one moment. Sure. You mentioned Lovecraft. The author, I mean, the author of this, part of what she has co-edited as collections of Lovecraftian short stories. Ah, see, now you can, you can tell. So I, I'm just, maybe that has some influence. I'd have to say so. Well, anyway, go ahead with what you're saying. So, yeah, you know, I, I've always been such a fan of, of both, um, both writers and, and just a mm -hmm. genre in itself. I mean, um, it's kind of funny that when you asked me about this, I was in the middle of reading a book called uh, Mina, which mm -hmm. takes up the story. So in, in Dracula, I know this is a completely different book, but it has no, something to do I, with this. I, okay, <laughs> that's fine. So we're, ta are we're tangents around okay. here all the time. All right, cool. So in, in, in the book, uh, Dracula. Mm -hmm. It is always the guy's side of this. Yes. Mina has a voice up to a point. Once they go after Dracula, once they are in country, as they call it, or on continent, because, you know, mm -hmm. England's off. <laughs> um, once they are in continent, they, Mina's voice is completely shut down. You don't yep. hear from her. She's not writing anymore very much. And you, you just don't hear her voice anymore. And it's always the got to protect the, the, you know, that helpless female, the female who fell for this, this awful, awful con or, or you know, this spell. She has been bespelled and enthralled because she's weak, which just pisses me off every time I read it. But it's a classic and I love it. Well, in. And it's interesting that you say that there because it's also there with Carmila. Exactly. Because with Carmila of, too. Except it's the predatory lesbian mm -hmm. doing the same exact thing. And that preceded Dracula by what 20 years. But by 20 years. Anyway. And and um, if you want to watch something really cool, I think it's on it's either on Hulu or Netflix, and it's called Marcella. It's Carmila's story. Mm -hmm. Very, very good. Anyway, yeah. so um, the book Mina, what it is, it's it's kind of taking Mina's perspective mm -hmm. during this whole time of being in country and being, uh, you know, how all the guys are just trying to protect her. And she's like, fuck off. You go oh, I'm sorry. Can we say that? Of course. Okay. Like, yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. Iris, you should know me by fucking now. <laughs> um, I, I know, but you know, this, sometimes podcasts don't have explicit, you know, markers. So just want to make sure I don't want to get you guys in trouble. So you know, and, and she's she's basically telling her I'm gonna fuck off. You know, I can, I have come this far, and you, and seriously, if you really think about it, they would not be that far if it wasn't for her. Right. Because she's that connection that they have to Dracula. Because of her, they know where she's at, where well, he's at, right? That and they're kind of the only reason in a way that they care about Dracula. Exactly. Dracula was fine when he was a good real estate client. Exactly. When he and was bringing all in he the money, was. fine. That's all he was. Oh, mm -hmm. I can certainly sell you a piece of real estate, Count Dracula. Finance. You know, it's it's all good, but then ooh. money, money, money. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, so I'll, so I'll have to read that. There is that, and then um, and then it goes into her life with Jonathan. Now, Jonathan, of course, has taken over uh, the uh, solicitors, you know, company mm -hmm. or, or you know the business. Uh, then it's her. She has lived this life and has felt this power surge through her. And yeah. now she has to squelch it all because now she has to be the, the proper English woman, the wife right. of a solicitor. Yeah. And so she finds a lover. And it is an extremely interesting book because a lover finds out who she is and what happened to her. Yeah. 
and he's an extremely narcissistic man who wants to quote unquote live forever. Yeah. So they exploit each other. And, and it's it's an it's a fascinating read. I will send you the uh, author's name because okay. off the top of my head, I don't have it. But he all she also has a book about the the fall of the House of Usher, mm -hmm. but from Madeline's side. Hmm. Or is, is it Madeline or Marilyn? Uh, the sister. I don't, I don't remember. At the House of Usher, but it's her point of view. So uh, I have that book too. I, I I was able to find the actual books, and I think I paid like sixty dollars for them. I don't care for all three. Um, <laughs> but anyway, you know, it, it, it there's all this, a lot of that in, in the these gothic, these ancient gothic uh, stories is where where the girl is, she's a damsel in distress. But she knows how to get things done, either by manipulating the men around her or with money. Either way. Right, right. And Naomi is very much that female in this book. Because and she, she even knows. says that. Yes, she knows exactly how to manipulate the men around her her daddy's got money she's got money she's from you know high society in mexico city so she knows how to do what she needs to do to have her daddy wrapped around her finger her boyfriend wrapped around her finger and when she gets out into the country with the doyles at high place she really doesn't have that advantage and if anything the doyles look at her as a piece of meat and basically a vagina that's what she is to them yeah because with her you know it, it's kind of like um <laughs> kind of like eddie izzard says you know you got to separate the genes <laughs> <laughs> you know. I know. I was just thinking about the royal family in the exactly. In the you know, like you're scraping the bottom of the pail here. You know, it was like mm, you can separated. only marry so many cousins. Exactly. Exactly. And um, it, and it, it just had so many elements. Like you, you had a little bit of the elements of House of Usher. You had a little bit of elements of Withering Heights, uh, the turning of the screw. You had a little bit of Poe thrown in there. Definitely a lot of Cthulhu mythos in there in the book mm -hmm. itself, which um, I thought was just fascinating. And, you know, it makes me kind of wonder if she has a background in botany. Being mm -hmm. that you mentioned that she had these short stories about fungi and then how That's fungi is a very central. interesting thing. Look, his, his, yeah, the, the. She, she did get a master's in science and technology studies. Hmm, interesting. But it doesn't say what the focus was when I looked it up. I'd be interested. I, I really wonder if she had just like maybe a minor in biology or just very interested in botany. You know, because um, for the fungus or, or right. for the, the spores to play such an important role. It, it's. Well, it, it's really weird because it's what literally and figuratively what holds everything together for the Doyles and for the story. Well, and yeah. And then like, it's not just, oh, you easily have these, these like scenes like where, okay, Francis is out there picking mushrooms right. and talking about different kinds of mushrooms or he's showing spore prints. Mm -hmm. like the talking the way talking about the spore prints i am the daughter of an entomologist i grew up looking at insects under a microscope no, well, hey there you go and then and, and and i had to sometimes look at plants under microscopes too and and i've seen fungi under microscopes like it's just 
how I grew up. And yeah, there was a, you're right. That would make so much sense. And, and you so know, talking sense. about the fungi in this, think of how many sci-fi stories we have had where spores come in to be it, it's spores right we've got invasion of the body snatchers uh the triffids um what was that silly movie with mark Wal uh, Wahlberg, uh where the plants were talking to each other and killing people <laughs> <laughs> the happening the happening thank you there are so many stories where you know um yeah. these these things that we cannot see these little things and to me, I mean, you've seen them under 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 a microscope. Yeah. Extremely Cthulhuite, okay? I mean, here we have uh, like elder things. <laughs> you know, it, it I you know, stuff that I've seen under under the microscope. So it's it's just how wonderful she just brings all of these elements together. And not only that, but then you have the the colonizer racist view of the Doyles. The Doyles, they, they're in Mexico, but nobody speaks Spanish. I know. Right? I know. Nobody speaks Spanish. Uh, Francis speaks Spanish on the down low. <laughs> right. <laughs> right? Um, the, the help is English. Of course. Um, so, and... And the doctor... The doctor is English. English. Um, so there's that family they secrecy. They don't trust the Mexican, you know, doctor. Right. Because, you know, uh, it, it's kind of like um, the, the, it, they're a step above, you know, racially and everything. Because when they're like, well, there's many beauties of, you know, your dark skinned beauties and blah, blah, blah. And he starts talking about eugenics and all this other the stuff. And she's like, fuck you. <laughs> and she goes right back at him, which mm -hmm. he's like, whoa. And you're smart, too. Right on. So it's it's just amazing. And as as women, Vanessa, I'm, I'm sure that you've yeah. you've come across this where if you show you're smart, you are no longer pretty. Yep. Or if you well, can... how many how many smart women who are also physically attractive will try to pretend they're dumb just exactly. to impl impress a man? Like exactly. I have, I saw that in school because I went to an all girls school and at Mercer the boys school my junior year. Mm -hmm. Some of those girls who had been making great grades until that year, they dumbed themselves down yep. in order to be like in front of the boys. Me, I'm like, are you whatever? I'm here to learn. <laughs> yes, like thanks, but no. That's why the guys liked me, like as a friend. Like we, I'm, we were all just like, yeah, whatever. You see, and that's the other point I was going to make. You're either, and if you're seen as a, as a peer, yeah, you are no longer a girl period right you're one of the boys right well i mean also i wasn't interested in them in another well, way yeah but, that, but you, you know, know side but, point. but but still you know it, it it happens where like when i was in the navy I, you know i could keep up with the guys okay, so true. i was not seen as the you know the female sailor or you know the girl in the shop i yeah. was one of them you know oh, was, well, yes you know i was considered one of them um, but here, you know, the Doyles, <clears throat> excuse me, they have such uh, stations and, and such, you know, that aristocratic view of highborn and lowborn, you know, that cast. And it's very, very well seen in this. And it plays such a good part in this, too, because um, when they very, very, very first showed up there, and the the priest was trying to keep everybody safe and everybody, you know, trying to keep that tribe cohesive. Uh, he saw it as a weakness, and as soon as he could take over, he did. Because why? Because we have the misogynistic patriarchal colonizer 
who is exploiting what he believes is a lower caste of people. And that is so well played in here. It's not beat over the head. You know, it's not like yeah. hitting you constantly and going, these people are awful. These people are awful. But it, it's at sometimes it is so subtle that you're like, oh, that was a serious burn, <laughs> you know, coming from right. either side. Right. And well, and also then it interjects even these other things where it's like a dig at the Spanish because mm -hmm. it's like, well, the Spanish were here first. And then when they did what they wanted to do with it and walked away. <laughs> I mean, like, exactly. They exactly. were like, oh, well, no, it's the, the, the indigenous people have already been exploited. So it, I, I like also that it brought that point there because mm -hmm. I, I've been thinking about this a lot lately because... I recently rewatched the movie El Norte. Oh, oh God. Which, mm. Darren, I you're probably not familiar with that movie. You need to watch it, man. You need to do yourself a favor and watch it. Um it's a it's from the eighties, right? Eighty three, mm -hmm. I think. Um Definitely haven't seen it, but I feel like I've heard about it. It's Mexican director, but it's like Guatemala. It's mostly Guatemalan, I think, actors, some Mexican actors, um, indig you know, indigenous to cast, which, you know, it's nice to see, okay, people that are playing these characters like that are Guatemalan and of indigenous descent actually have those features and have the darker skin. I mean, like they don't, they're not Spanish, European, white, fair skinned, <laughs> you know, Latina yeah. actors, like which that there's a time and place for that. But this was specifically the story of those people coming from Guatemala into Mexico and then to the, you know, United States, like, immigrating. But even there, and what you see tinges of here is that, well, you know, those Indians, they all look alike kind of feeling right, right. from even those, the Mexican, you know, the Mexican people who are of more Spanish descent yeah. or, you know, or of, uh, 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 you know, you know, whatever other uh, European descent, there. yeah, yeah, of other European descent, because it's it's just, and it it is true. I mean, I was even oh, dude, it is so true. I mean, I've had conversations with my mom, um, yeah. where it is so ingrained, you know, into her generation. Uh, they have a saying, you know, like, in, if somebody's being like acting dumb or just being stupid or not being very smart, they will say, well, stop being so indito. Indito is don't be such an Indian or an indigenous person because that's how they were seen. And right. you have, you have Latinos telling other Latinos saying those things to them. So it is so, uh, just so indoctrinated in to generations, even into generation X, where if you're Hispanic and are seen as being indigenous, you're a lower caste. It it's just not right. You know, so and, and I'm like, mom, you've got to stop doing that. She's like, well, you know, like, no, mom, <laughs> like, well, that's a very European way of seeing things. Just because you're being like a little Indian, like an indigenous person doesn't mean you're stupid. Like, well, think well, of the things, think of the things we've done. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Um, oh, and you, another book you need to write, another thing you need to read, Inventing Latinos. Oh, by okay. Laura E. Gomez. Uh, I read that came out i think last year or the year before but uh i recently read that about how 
the Latino identity has evolved and is still evolving. It is. And it's really, and I think it's evolving mostly because of uh, Gen X and millennials trying, Mm -hmm. you know, wanting to have some sort of root. And, you know, even to this day, uh, I was watching, I'm on TikTok and I like to watch TikTok, you know, it's a thing. Um, Good. Okay, good. Um, I was watching. You're allowed. (laughs) Okay, good. Thank you. I mean, you know, I'm not one of the Gen Zs. So (laughs) anyway, uh, and there is a Spaniard who had made a TikTok just livid, completely livid that we were take that the statue of Christopher Columbus that is in, uh, you know, in Mexico City. Uh-huh. They are taking that down yes. and putting a statue of an Olmec woman. I know. And this guy is just ranting of how can they do that of a good Catholic man who brought, you know, religion and morals and values and ethics to the savages that were sacrificing children and women. And I'm like, motherfucker, shut the fuck up. <laughs> that was not happening. <laughs> I was like, wow. And and see, so, of course, again, it is the winner who dictates history. And it doesn't, and that, you know, and that also narrative doesn't even come, bring up the fact of, we're going on a real tangent. Hello. (laughs) But he was, he even got condemned by his own people for some of his crimes. Exactly. But you know, you're not taught that in school. No, are you? And it's the same thing here with the Doyles. The Doyles are just kind of like, we brought, you know, prosperity to these people, these people. Right. And and how we rescued them. We rescued them. We rescued them. And because there's, nothing here now they have nothing and and so it's just like this this white savior complex right yeah (laughs) you know uh, uh, darren i'm sorry darren you can chime in anytime yes please i'm sorry i just realized we've been going no i was hoping you'd forget i was here i'm enjoying this conversation (laughs) i know you you do that sometimes but please feel free to jump in yes yes (laughs) don't don't let me hog up the whole time here (laughs) Uh, well, I, I will say that I live in a Columbus and people freak the fuck out when one of the like five Columbus statues came down. Oh, wow. And, really? And when um, the city council voted to start cele- uh, celebrating, you know, Indigenous Peoples Day instead of Columbus Day and stuff like that, people are just losing their minds. And there's still, I could probably find a statue of Columbus in, you know, 20 minutes if I started walking, it feels like. And it's, there's just that scraping that people in power and in control have over these ridiculous idols to terrible people. It, well, it's, you know, there, there's all, every couple years, there's a, petition to change the city's name after some famous person that didn't do as many bad things but you know the only that'd be hard to famous find. people yeah <laughs> i mean what uh like randy macho man randy savage is from here and rl <laughs> stein <laughs> and the guy that directed trick-or-treat and that's pretty much it for this this city they might have to expand it to flip i let's name it after devo or, there you uh, go. Yeah, from, yeah, 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 yeah. Or, I mean, that's Akron, yeah. though. Or, yeah, but if they just want to do <laughs> like the state, the capitals, the state capital is named after a better famous Ohioans, or change it, <laughs> change it to Flavor Town. The Guy <laughs> Fieri's from here, and he didn't do as many bad things. Oh, there you go. Uh, <laughs> Guy yes. Town. Ooh. Not that we know of. I mean, other. Uh, yeah, I, I guess, but you know. <laughs> anyway, uh, oh, I I also was getting a bit of a Rebecca bo- vibe from the book. Yes, very much oh, so. That is such an astute, like, yeah, you're right. I do. Yeah, you just kind of like you gotta def- protect, you know, and and. Well, yeah, it's the Daphne du Maurier kind of 
like feel too because rebecca and like the birds has this way of t building the tension too i mean like she wrote that short story mm -hmm. um but in some other things and they all have that this same kind of sweeping thank you darren for pointing that out i i didn't even think about that but that is right on the money yeah you know florence you know that that's she gives off very much that feel of you know uh, the lady of the house and you know you can't touch this and you can't touch that and, and she's in charge of it, it yeah i get that and rebecca god damn that's another real good one huh but uh yeah good good one there dude because um even with the uh you know the guy who sweeps this girl off of her feet and even though her uncle which is naomi's naomi's dad didn't really like him but you know that's what you do as a girl at that back then you know you yeah virgil yeah virgil you know he he just comes in sweeps her away and never heard from him again and, and, and your it's money it, and your jeans exactly your money and your jeans that's exactly and, and you know that, that's again you know that that that's at that time that's what women were used for collateral <laughs> collateral was a, an expectation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. even if people weren't overtly saying it it was still it very much implied very you know and, and it still is i mean you know think of there were transactions there were transactions between two families it's still very much chattel mm -hmm. yeah with the royal family i feel exactly you know i it's knew like that, that as soon as i mean like you saw that with like whatever the recent like harry and william and those marriages and all that stuff and like as soon as the Everybody was like all excited about the Kate Middleton getting married. I'm like, I'm sitting there like, okay, I give her nine months to pop out a kid. Exactly. I was like, I, I just knew because I, I knew that was all she was there for. And I was pretty much on the money. I don't care about those people but in their lives. But I was kind of like, yeah, it's kind of sad that it's still that way. Yeah. I mean, how many... Uh of Henry's wives were, you know, went to the chopping block because, you know, they just couldn't pop out the boy. <laughs> it, it's always been like that, but you know, it, it's, it's that aristocratic sense of, or the highborn sense of your lineage having to go on because somebody needs to be in charge of the lower castes and, and not because it's good for them, but it's because somebody needs to keep them in their place. And you see a lot of that here. Uh, another thing that I really enjoyed was, and again, a sense of maybe this girl has some botany in her background, Marta and her, uh, you know, the curandera, basically, yeah, of the village. Uh, I really like that aspect and that element of, you know, She's there and she knew exactly what she was doing. So that means that she did have some idea of the spores and what they were doing to people. And she, right. she had that ancient knowledge that so sad that is just slowly disappearing because nobody can make money off of it. Well, absolutely. And she was the healer you know and even the mexican doctor in the village mm -hmm. they were the catalyst that helped he he you know he had certain medical training from a more western point of view so mm -hmm. to say mm -hmm. but he still had the understanding and respect for the traditional herbal home remedies i feel and marta he he knew enough about her that she wasn't going to steer somebody wrong right he 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 like i said respect he knew that she knew what she was doing like that didn't that doesn't sound like something she would do right 
And what's interesting, though, is uh, the doctor, he was from from that village. Mm -hmm. So more than likely, as a child, Marta... He was treated by her. Treated him a couple of times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. And then you got Noemi, who is like, you know, Catalina tells her, you know, go get this for me. And Noemi's like, from that lady? But what? Yeah. Because she is, you know, a, a Mexican highborn. Um, so her way of thinking, again, is more westernized. So when she comes here, and all of a sudden she is from feeling from a highborn cast. From Mexico City. From Mexico City. Yeah. Treated like a lower caste person by Europeans who don't even belong there. I think it kind of put the shoe in the other foot and it made her change a little bit of the way she was thinking because even with her, with the dude that she was kind of like stringing along. Right. You know, she started rethinking of like, oh, you know, maybe that's kind of like a shitty thing to do. Maybe I should just let him go. Right. You know, and then uh, her caring for Francis, how all that, you know, kind of switched around and everything. It, it's just, you see a, a little girl walk into a situation that at the end, she walks out a full grown woman, extremely mature and ready to take on the world. Well, because it force it forces her to grow up in mm -hmm. some things, even though she's a really of adult age already. But so she, she's a spoiled little brat. Yeah. Um. So it's it's a you know it's it's which is an indif a different way of telling this story. Even I feel than other you have like a a gothic tale where you have some woman who's gone through something yeah I, it still doesn't have this kind of feel where it doesn't give you a character that has this kind of same transformation i feel but i don't know no it, it, it's true I, and i think maybe that's what i i really enjoyed about this it's like it wasn't there was a damsel in distress, but it wasn't the main character. Yeah. And it ends up being the two women who take down this, um, I, don't know, I guess you could call it a regime a um, or a cult of people. A cult, I feel, is more accurate. Yeah, you know, and, and they, they take down this cult of people. Who Which really that, end up spoiler everybody. Yeah, spoiler. <laughs> I'm sorry. Shit. Um, said, but you know, no, no, it's... I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I already we said that everybody. at the beginning. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah. yeah. And we um, usually spoil things anyway, but this is probably the most recent thing, like I said, that we've ever read. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. But you know, yeah. these girls take care of these people in, in such a uh I wouldn't say violent, but just a very finalized and very yeah, a very final way. And I really, really enjoyed that. It wasn't like a guy came in to save the day at the end. He tried. <laughs> but it was a girl who ended up doing everything that needed to happen. So, yeah, I really, really enjoyed that fact. And, and you know, being that it was probably a female, it was a female writer. That's more than likely what it was happening. But, well, um, and then I, the vision of Ruth that kept coming up yes like like basically saying like as a warning like you don't understand like mm -hmm. still like it's a woman trying to get another like plus like a red red flag to another woman right and it, it... I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but if you really think about it, yeah, with all the bravado and all the chest thumping and everything, 
that these men, the Doyles were doing, well, not just the Doyles, but the doctor and Naomi's dad and everything, it comes down to a woman. It is the woman who holds everything together. Mm -hmm. And she is the one that perpetuates whatever the Doyles need to continue doing what they are doing. So without the woman that they so think is um, either lower caste or, uh, you know, just a secondary citizen collateral or transaction, that is what holds them together. Yeah. And, and, and I love that because in, in the end, that's what it is. It's, it's, it's that female that does everything for everyone. So I, I don't know. I just thought that was pretty, pretty cool. Absolutely. Absolutely. Darren. Yeah. Uh, uh, like I said, I've, I've been largely enjoying getting an early peek at this, uh, this insight from you two. Uh, I don't have a lot to add. Usually when I read Gothic stuff, usually I'm kind of bored until near the end. And then that's how I figure out whether or not I like a book or not, <laughs> at least uh, literature wise. But this one didn't take as long. This one grabbed me in faster than some of the others that I that I attempted, you know. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know a whole lot about the genre because of that. I mostly just read what people tell me to there because that way, you know, it's like like me and Vanessa, you'll get this. It's like me with found footage movies. I dislike so many that it's better when people who know me suggest one. Hmm. And, um, <laughs> yeah. And I'm in so, single with you, dude. Cool. Yeah. So yeah, that's kind of how, how it was. And I was like, man, I'm, I was having trouble getting it started. And then uh, Amanda actually got it out and she blasted through it in like a day. And she's like, you should really read it. Uh, so that made it two people who told I, me I should read the book. I figured she would enjoy it. Oh, yeah. And it just seemed so gothic literature that at one point Noemi was like smoking a cigarette in the cemetery thinking about Mary Shelley. Yeah, wasn't that awesome? <laughs> <laughs> I, I love like, is that it, there is were it a clove these... cigarette? Let me know. Is it a clove cigarette? It had to have been. <laughs> <laughs> well, and they were expensive cigarettes, though, that she did point out. But and I mean, it was just there were little cheeky moments I felt I felt in there that, yeah, I just kind of. Yeah, there were a lot of beautiful nods to the genre and, and to, you know, the major writers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, I think this was a great pick. Uh, not that we're necessarily done, but I would say. If, for, if you're listening to this at this point and you haven't read the book for some reason, I think you should. Yeah, or or you can listen to it. That's what I did. I was listening to it while I was while I was working, and um, I think it's a ten hour listen, I believe. And, and I, I did it in a day. It, it was just so good and so engaging. And of course, you know the the gal who was reading was also very. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you've got to have a good reader, or else it's I, just gonna absolutely. like. Blah. <laughs> yep. So no matter uh, how good the book is. Exactly. If if the reader is reading like this and just doesn't have any, yeah, no, I can't listen to that. Or if they mispronounce well, the names. Oh so my god! Yeah. Well, no, th this gal was. Uh, I th believe she's of. Uh, yes, she is of. Uh, Latin descent. Her name's Frankie Corzo, and it, yeah, she she. It, it was just like a perfect voice for knowing me. Uh, in this mm -hmm. whole thing. So yeah, it was really, really good. Well, the, the author's new book is, um, a vampire book. 
Yes, and it looks so good. Yeah, Velvet was the night. I'm I'm like, I'm there. Yeah. Yeah, and then I believe she has another one. Um well she where... has quite a lot of of things. Yeah, I, I think it's something where it is it goes back to the ancient gods. Mm-hmm. Oh, gods um, of Jade and Shadow. Yes, yeah. yes. I saw yeah, that, that one when I was looking around. Yeah, so I, I I'm looking forward to that one too. I'm waiting for my 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 credits to show up on audio. <laughs> 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 yeah, but yeah, you know, it, it's 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 a really engaging and read. Um, I mean, I could go on and on about this because there are just so many things that I really, really enjoyed in this. It's just um, how it pulls in the, 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 not only the Latin culture, but also the Hispanic culture. And, right. Um, you know, and, and that's something that a lot of people don't know the difference between the Latin culture and Hispanic. You know, Hispanic is mm -hmm. European. So you, it's that Spaniard european culture uh then you have the latin culture which is latin america which would be from mexico all the way down into chile and um a, a lot of people forget that right they 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 when people think of of a spanish speaking person they it they either go hispanic or mexican one or two uh, uh, you know, not that that's, you know, but to me, I don't care if I get called Mexican or whatever. <laughs> you know, I speak Spanish. Don't give a fuck. No. <laughs> my parents, though, my mom, if you call her Mexican, she gets so, so angry. <laughs> She's like, I'm from El Salvador. I was like, Mom, it, we're all just one big, <laughs> you know, it's just one big landmass, Mom. <laughs> But yeah, um, but yeah, that you know, there is that distinction. Uh, the Hispanic culture is very Spanish centric, uh, as in Spaniard, you know, they're mm -hmm. the dark skinned uh, or, or dark haired, light eyes, and light skinned. Uh, like my mother has a lot of Spaniard blood in her because she is she's white with blue eyes and jet black hair. And my dad, on the other hand, is still European because he has Armenian blood, but he has more indigenous blood because he is that olive chocolate skin, dark eyes, dark hair. And then I ended up with his dark skin, my mom light eyes, and her hair. So, and then my brother ends up with red hair because it's that Spanish, that, that yeah. Hispanic line, right? And and I'm more of the Latino line. So yeah, it, it, it's, yeah. And then again, eugenics, right here, here we have genetics again, uh, how uh, the mixture of things, because um, the patriarch, how he was talking of the mixture, right. Of that highborn blood, that European Hispanic blood with the lower, but beautiful, Latino blood, and, and they were making these gorgeous beauties. And I was like, well, oh and this God. also, it, this also plays into going back to the book I mentioned earlier, inventing Latinos, where you start talking about the mestizo people, mm -hmm. where then all of a sudden this different kind of class of people is created. Right, right, and, and it's a it's a class of people that doesn't belong anywhere right it's, yeah it's kind of like the creoles they yes. were they weren't white enough to be a part of the white society but then they weren't but they were too white to be part of the people of color society so there's there's this group of, and it's the same thing with the mestizos the mestizos uh, you know people call me mestiza or my dad because mm -hmm. you can see those that hispanic and that latino uh, genetics in in one person right light eyes dark skin dark hair yeah, yeah. so oh, oh, you know they are stuck in this this world where you, you're you you're not part of either world only if they want you there which is kind of sad <laughs> 
I mean, you know, it, it doesn't happen to me, but I'm sure, you know, a hundred years ago, they were outcasts on, on both sides. Because you yeah. were, you either you were too Spanish and you weren't part of the indigenous culture. And then, of course, the Spaniards were like, well, you're a bastard child, so go away. Well, I wouldn't even say, I mean, and depending on where you're talking about, I wouldn't even say a hundred years ago. You're oh, talking, oh, think about 50 or years ago or, or yeah, no. 60, 60 years Very ago true. when this book is supposed to take place. Yeah. This is supposed to be in the 1950s. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so yeah. that's, that's going to be, that really wasn't that long ago in some of these like some areas where this mentality was still so prevalent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, and sadly is some people, it's still more it's still prevalent than we is. like it's to admit. But, yeah. Um, we just maybe don't talk about it as openly. I mean, at least some of these people that, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously we do have, some assholes that are storming the Capitol pretty much saying it right there in the open. Right. Right. But, but, but you know uh, what, when you have permission to hate openly, you're going to do it. <laughs> yeah. And that's pretty much what they got. So anyway, uh. <laughs> anyway, we can start going on a tangent and then the tangent for really Darren's other show, which is, which is more the politics one, although we get political here at times. Okay. <laughs> it just happens. <laughs> but I mean, this book kind of, I mean, there really is this kind of underlying thing, but I feel like it's handled very well in that it doesn't take away from any of the atmosphere of it being still a pure kind of gothic mm -hmm. like genre story right it's not preaching you yeah it, it's just kind of like you get two for one <laughs> right it's extremely subtle it's a, it's a subtle undertone throughout the whole book yeah yeah and and there are times where you know it's not so subtle but right. it's because it's conversations that two characters have not uh the author pushing her for lack of a better word agenda on you mm -hmm. and so you know that's another thing that i really enjoyed of this book it's just it's just these undertones in there and it is not just the racism and the misogyny and everything but just the beauty of of being you know this indigenous people and the beauty of being you know kind of like in a different world than everybody yeah. else so yeah, th th it's a very layered story, but these layers are just so fine and so almost um, muslin, you know, it it's there, but, but you can see through all of these layers and still get this beautiful story coming out of basically a, a coming of age story in a very gothic way. True. True. And then my two cents. Okay. Darren. Yes. Anything. Oh add? no, I'm not I'm not following that. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> two thumbs up, two spores up. There's people in the walls. Yeah, that's right, there's people in the walls. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it can happen. I be I've been watching. Okay, I have been watching as, and I say watching. It means I have Discovery Plus, and I throw on in the background a lot of these you, just um, things that qualify under paranormal and unexplained. <laughs> and I've been having. Even before October began, I started going through all of these ones for, you know, for, I think it was the series, A Haunting or whatever. Oh, and those are so, good. And I mean, some of the effects are just so terrible, but, are, are, and, and the recreations are really just laughable. And you're like, 
really, you, it wouldn't have taken that much more effort for you to do that to make it look a little bit, you know, more realistic. But whatever, you know, that's just me. Um, I digress. But so it just, I've been having some of these on and I catch these bits of these things of their images of like things coming out of the walls and stuff. And so I've been sitting there and having that like surrounded with me and then I'll sit there and I'll start kind of reading this. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, it does make so much sense. And I've been to enough places and I was going to ask both of you this. This is my last thing I wanted to say about the, the really rich related to the book. Uh, I think, I mean, Iris, I think you said more than I, I yeah, I could say that <laughs> other than, yeah, thumbs up too. And, yes. um, but it's just, I've had a few experience, like supernatural experiences in my life. And mm -hmm. been to enough places. I haven't necessarily seen a ghost like apparition like body shape, but uh, I have been touched by them. Ooh. Yeah. Um and and I've had them, you know, in different rooms with me, mm -hmm. but it's just I get that I really get this. I mean, the way that was described in this, it made me feel like the author is someone who has had that kind of experience at least once. Oh, most definitely, especially the way she tells of how Ruth shows up and, and you know, it's that harbinger. Yeah. Um, most definitely. Yeah. I I mean, I <laughs> I've got a couple of stories of things happening like um i was in charleston and i had an opportunity to move off of the ship that i was stationed on and to actually live in a house with a bunch of other sailors you know yeah. there was two other couples and they had an extra room so i was like <clears throat> you know i'll give you guys money can i have that other room and they're like yes please okay so you know i'm moving in my stuff and everything um the guys were there. The girls weren't. And uh, they were, you know, helped me move boxes and stuff. It was just like this one really huge box in the bed. So um, at the time, I was practicing more pagan uh, beliefs at the time. And mm -hmm. I was you know, kind of like smudging the room. I was cleaning the room. Something just didn't feel good in there. So I was just doing that. And as I'm doing that, <clears throat> this little boy peeks his head in. It's it just a cutest shit little kid with overalls. I remember the red and white striped shirt. And he just pokes his head in and smiles. And I kind of looked at him and I smiled back. And I was about to say, hi, come in. You know, kind of like, who are you? But I didn't. And then yeah. he kind of like brought his bed back and, and kind of like walked out of the the area never stepped into the room and you know i continued doing what i was doing putting stuff away blah 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 so i finally done and i come out i'm gonna come out and sit with the guys and i'm like who's the little kid and they both look at me like what the little boy blonde hair blah 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 and their faces go white and i'm like what <laughs> apparently the guys had been messing around with, okay, yes, they were messing around with the Ouija board. Doesn't mean that they were bringing something evil or anything, but Agreed. <laughs> they were talking to a little boy named Caleb. And or so they thought, or so they thought, and that's how he described himself. Exactly how I told them. And I was like, okay, glad I didn't invite the kid into the room. I'm glad I smudged. Mm. If you guys are going to do that, make sure you close the door when you're done. <laughs> yes. Don't leave the door open. <laughs> but, you know, I've said like that. And then I've seen stuff where a little scarier stuff with um, my parents are uh, Baptist ministers. And 
<laughs> well, that's enough said. <laughs> I, dude, I have seen chairs just go from one side of the room like if somebody threw them and go across the other side, hidden towards my mom, and something just it just stops. Like like there's a wall there. And I've seen just the weirdest shit because of yeah, stuff that yeah, man. So yes, I am a believer that there I believe that there is something else out there. <laughs> Whether it's all friendly or not, completely up to you. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> and and from the way she talked about things and how she presented stuff, I very much agree with you. Yeah, she's she's had experiences. Yeah. Darren, what about you? Yeah, I'm I'm trying to think of some good ones that didn't that weren't part of the time. Like in high school, we used to regularly like take acid and go to the train station <laughs> where uh you know, like the Lincoln Ghost train is supposed to go through there and there's uh a hobby Are shop you sure upstairs. You saw a train? No. <laughs> Was it, you well, know, no. like the recreational <laughs> usage of medicine or was it uh, really a ghost? <laughs> right. Uh, but there at that train station at a different time, your your story, Iris, made me think of one of my friends uh, always saw a little boy at the top of the stairs uh, where I guess a young boy had fallen out of the window and died. Oh, wow. uh, we I I never saw him. I was always looking for him. But uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of stuff was mostly sounds, like being in uh, my girlfriend's house alone, uh, waiting for her to show up, and I would hear like the Jack in the Box cranking in the basement. Oh fuck uh, no! Uh uh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck yeah, no. <laughs> I would be breaking up with that chick. I was like, done, bye. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I, it, it seemed like a lot of times, uh, who or whatever it was, like to fuck with me, because there was lots of things like that. And then one time, a friend of mine was working when ghost hunting shows were all big. A friend of mine yeah. was working on a pilot for one. And we went and did a hunt overnight in a theater where there had been a fire and a lot of deaths and stuff way back in the day. Ooh. And when I was up in the attic or the loft, something threw something at me. <laughs> and I ran for my life. I saw it. It, it looked like a coin. Mm -hmm. and i was alone and i like they made us do everybody took all the shit out of their pockets before they went into the building so it didn't fall out of a pocket and it went sideways not down anyway oh um wow. and there's a uh covered bridge well, about an hour and a half outside the city here where a different girlfriend was really into photography and trying to get stuff on uh, film. There was a, like a railroad bridge where somebody got hit by a train, but near there is a bridge where you hear crying babies. Oh, one of those. And... Yeah. So like if, if you get like into a certain part, you, you hear a crying baby. Mm -hmm. I, I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. And uh, a, a no, lot of stuff that's creepy in the least. <laughs> <laughs> a, a lot of stuff that you know, I'm not sure because a, a lot of my more explorative times was in high school on some sort of intoxicant. But I mean, there's uh, this is Ohio, so there is a cemetery that used or where uh. Civil War POW camp used to be where a bunch of Confederates were killed. Oh, wow. And that's pretty close to Children's Hospital. So, uh, I mean, one time when I was in the hospital as a kid, I thought I saw a couple uh, Confederate 
people walking around um but nobody saw as soon as i got everybody to look out the window nobody could see anything so yes i also believe some shit can happen you know i think as long as you're open to it and i mean you got to come with it with a little bit of skepticism but not completely like you know oh fuck no because it's those oh fuck no people that all of a sudden have a very come to jesus meeting <laughs> sometimes yeah right oh and a different girl fucked around with a ouija board in a bad way and i did never go see her again yeah see that that that's that's what i used to tell my son is crazy crazy vagina and you just don't don't mess with crazy vagina it's just yeah. just leave it alone yeah uh, so yeah uh and you said smudging uh i only <laughs> learned what that was a couple years ago Oh, really? uh, from from a native filmmaker, uh, Mike Marin. Uh, he made a documentary called Cinema Red about mm. natives and the horror film genre, uh, fans and working in. Uh, but he made a really low budget horror movie called The Smudging oh. uh, when, when he was living in Chicago. And it's about, yeah, trying to cleanse a building. Yeah, it's it's very uh, popular and very uh, appropriated. I'd have to say. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Yeah, he he is a he is how a. How many native hippies do it? But... <laughs> how many hippies do it? Let's be honest. But they just call it burning sage. Yeah. 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 If I if I yeah if I saw a hippie just be like I'm gonna smudge like I don't okay. <laughs> I, I think we have to have a conversation. <laughs> Ooh, was the Manitou in in in? Oh God, I love that movie, The Manitou. But anyway, <laughs> uh, lots of tangents here. Sorry, that's no. quite all right. Well, it sounds like we would all recommend the book. Oh, most definitely. And, yeah, um, and it sounds like we all kind of want to get read more from this author um yeah yeah you're i mean iris you said it pretty much right up top and there, there's so many different influences he, here in this alone that i mean you can only see where she might go in in other work yeah yeah and and i'm a yeah like the the one about jade and what was that again darren Hmm? the the jade and um oh the book yeah uh, and the old gods gods of jade and shadow yes yes, yes. Uh, i'm extremely curious about that one um yeah being yeah. that she's going to go into more of the you know the the ancient aztec mayan type of I, gods it's it's i know it'll be very very interesting to read mm -hmm. yeah yeah I'm excited about that. But I'm also excited about Velvet Was the Night because, well, vampires. Well, yeah, vampire. <laughs> <laughs> and we know Vanessa and vampires. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, Iris, we are, we are going to take a break um, so we can refill our water. Are you going to be have you decided yet if you're going to be joining joining us for our movie discussion or not no, um, you know i it's been so long since i've seen this movie and i completely apologize not watching it um, no i think there was a miscommunication maybe on my part um yeah i i thought it was like it was either going to be the devil's backbone or the book and i was like well i'll go for the book <laughs> because i haven't read a good book in a while oh, uh, no. but you know i mean I can try to no, uh, add it, to the conversation, but I don't think it's going to be much. <laughs> it's it's perfectly fine. We had a wonderful discussion on the book. Uh, like I said, I'm I've been wanting to have you on for a while, and I've been wanting to discuss this book for a, since I read it earlier oh, awesome. this year for the awesome. first time. Yeah. No, and I, again, you know, it, it's been, uh, it was awesome to be on, especially with this, you know, we, we watch a lot of movies and stuff, but I love this, this niche that you have where you have a book and a story 
that go together and um it's extreme you know it's very much a niche there's not a lot of people doing this so well, you and yeah. i and i will say we we've, we've slacked off a little on our reading this year just um because of quarantine schedule but anyway go ahead with what you're saying yeah no i i i think it's it's you know, you've got a, you've cornered the market on this, so go for it. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> and we've got a weird name. <laughs> yeah, well, and then there's that name. I was like, so hey, Lynn, I'm going to be recording at the at the VD Clinic, and now she's like, that excuse me. <laughs> Is there something you need to tell me? <laughs> <laughs> it's Vanessa and Karen. She goes, oh, interesting name. <laughs> <laughs> So it yeah, because yeah. I replaced a David. Yeah, you know, it, yeah. It, it, exactly. And but that yeah, was you know, not planned on my part, but well, but it worked out, didn't it? It's faded, right? Exactly. It was fate. So, uh, yeah, you know, I can, yeah, I can stick around. Okay, then, great. Iris will be sticking around, so we are still going to take a break so we can get more water. <laughs> uh, yes. Okay, so we shall be back shortly. <laughs> right. This'll keep it quiet. Oh, hi there. I didn't see you. You caught me cutting a new show. I'm Bo Ransdell, and I'm one of the many creators you can find on Legion Podcasts. I said quiet! My fellow podcasters and I work hard to bring you the best in horror podcasting, but that comes at a cost. What's that? Not that, but also, yes. No, what I'm getting at is that there are server costs, costs for good microphones and software for editing, all the things that make our shows, you know, fun to listen to. And you can help. If you're enjoying the shows on legionpodcasts.com or in the Legion Network available on iTunes and Stitcher, just about anywhere you can download a podcast, really, you can help us out and get a little something for your trouble at patreon.com forward slash legionpodcasts. For just two bucks a month, you get a pair of movie commentaries exclusive to Patreon, and for five dollars, you can also join us for a monthly screening of a movie. All of that available on patreon.com forward slash Legion Podcasts. We appreciate it, and thank you for listening. Now, back to the cutting room. That's that southern hospitality we've heard. Mm -hmm. Anyway, thank you. We yeah, we're back from <laughs> our break yes, we are back officially, oh. and yes, thank you, Iris, for sticking around for our movie, which is The Devil's Backbone, um, from Guillermo del Toro, two thousand one, and wow, I had not seen this in a while. I have to tell you, <laughs> so, um. I know, Iris, you said you didn't watch it for tonight, today. So, but still, it's almost like how I feel to some extent. <laughs> like, because I was just like, I I totally forgot that happened. Or whatever, when I did see some of it. Uh, Darren, what about you? Had you seen this before? Or is this something that you watch that often? Because... As far as like Del Toro's films, this is not one that I watch as often as some others. I probably watch this if a uh, less times than I've seen Pan's Labyrinth, but I mm -hmm. love Guillermo del Toro. And uh I was on our friend Duncan's uh podcast under the stairs summer series the year that this was up and I had that year. So that, that was last summer yeah. was the last time I watched this because I think everybody said, well, we gotta, we've got to talk about devil's backbone. <laughs> um, and you know, Duncan uh, always likes non-American movies to, to get in there because they're a little less seen than some well Go ahead. It, no, go ahead. No, 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 please. No, I was going to say that it's true. And especially this was earlier in Del Toro's career. 
you know, this wasn't the shape of water. Is that the one? That is a Guillermo del Toro movie. The, <laughs> Thank you. The, I'm like, all of a sudden, I'm like, that's not the one, is it? The um, the creature from the Black Lagoon, Abe Sapien yeah. love story yeah, the, movie? With yes. Jim Jones and, and, yeah, and Michael Shannon. and um, But it it's just, it, that's like Oscar winning, like, you know, it gets them all this big attention he wasn't getting such attention. Like he was getting some attention from critics at this point, but not on this mass level. He didn't have the funding behind him either. And, and I feel that this, it, 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 you know, it, it's interesting because Del Toro is Mexican, but yet this is supposed to take place in, you know, Spain and in Franco's Spain but I, I don't think it matters it's just it's interesting that he puts it in that kind of political setting um also but what's more stuff? scary than a political setting I well it's right. true and the way he uses kind of this metaphor of like this ghost metaphor for like what the horrors of war mm -hmm. kind of is just really i mean it's really kind of interesting these, these ways that where you see and, and you see this is a theme throughout i think a lot of del toro's work where it's you know, humans are the real monsters. It's not the so-called monsters. Right? Right. Jacinto. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's the, but... it's the people who in their gr that that have this element of greed that are dri that's dr you know, driving them. That are the bad guys. It's not you know, it's not Doctor. It's not Doctor Sarez. Uh, Cesares. It's not the headmistress Carmen. It's you know the the people who want to take care of these children legitimately. It's it's these ones who are there only for greed, and I mean that they only care about greed. Well, it is and what then, drives a lot of people, though. Well, of course, of course. And it's just... Yeah, and, and the way that... And, and there was something that... Visually with this made me think of the images that were created in the book we read. As far as like that gold, like that's in the fungal images that were supposed to imagery that, you know, you kind of read about in Mexican Gothic. Mm -hmm. I felt that there were some of those same like visual things kind of pulled in here and there. Yeah, and um, if I remember correctly with this movie, mm -hmm. it's um, Jacinto has um, ties with the uh, loyalists. Am I correct? And there's like gold. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this is the movie. Okay. So yeah, he's hiding gold, right? And right. Um, he wants I, I like gold. <laughs> Right. Um, but then there's the there's another couple that takes care of the kids too. That's what I'm saying. The the doctor and the headmistress, Carmen. Oh, Caceres and Carmen. Okay. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, and Jacinto was a boy from the orphanage who ran away 
got in with some shitty people and then came back to become yeah, the, comes back. Right. the groundskeeper. Right. Okay. right. And who, who's working there. And to even see how he treats Conchita, who works at the orphanage, you know, it shows that he he doesn't even, there's nothing he can even care about other than the, other than that gold, really. So he's like Virgil. Okay. Yeah. And right. Interesting. That's right. Okay. And the Doyles. I mean, there's something about that. Like, there's re it really all of that. That. And you keep seeing these, the flash of gold throughout this movie where the gold bars are revealed here or there or there's there are flicks of gold throughout even um it, yeah it's just it, it just something about it reminded me about the book just that you kind had of flick of pretty, gold. pretty quickly when you start talking about this cuz you i mean you had these paired paired together pretty quickly as soon as you started the germ of the idea said it's probably going to be mexican gothic and devil's backbone but i'll see and then you know 4 months later it's exactly what happened yeah i kept going back and forth like should it be another movie i mean should it be another movie and then i was like no this actually fits i think pretty well because it's still you have in Mexican Gothic. It takes place post Mexican Revolution then, me, me, <laughs> post Mexican Revolution. Mm -hmm. This Devil's Backbone is taking place during a kind a, a, a revolutionary time as well. Right, it was Franco, Franco right? Exactly, yeah. um, in the 1930s. So. And you even, and I love that you have the things like this bomb that has fallen in the middle of the orphanage kind of, you know, quad, and it didn't go off. And it's just stuck there, and they can't move it. And it's got these ribbons hanging off the end of it. And when the boy Carlos wants or needs is asking to help, you know, find his way to Santi, the ghost, so he can try to communicate and try to figure out what, why are you trying to show yourself to me? What's going on? Tell me, tell me what happened. Um, it is one of the ribbons from the bomb that rips off and kind of starts pointing the way, pointing the way and like through the wind and everything. It's kind of like this way leading down to uncover the mysteries. And it it's, again, goes back to like Mexican Gothic, these kind of, it's the same kind of gothic thing of here's something that is going to point the way through this mystery just until you can discover the truth and until you can come through the other side triumphant. It's kind of like the omniscient NPC. Mm hmm. Mm. You know, the one that has all the answers, but you have to work for it. Right. Right. And uh, I mean, there there is all that focus on the unexploded bomb, which was dropped by Franco's troops. Right. Yes. And uh, yes, yeah, because Casares and Carmen, they support the Republican loyalists and uh, Carlos's dad. What did they call him? A comrade who died in the front. Mm -hmm. And I mean the the bomb is unexploded, but their lives in the orphanage are destroyed anyway because of the war. 
Well, right. They were already on living unlimited means trying to feed the children. I was uh, selling that. Uh, speaking of healers and stuff, uh, uh, Casares is a doctor, but he's selling what? Enchanted rum mm -hmm. to, to people who, because he says something about if you believe it works, it might work. And uh, so he's selling the bottles of rum to people in town. And that's uh, one of those jarring scenes where they're lining up the people up against the wall. And he's flinching every time because everybody else is just going along like it's daily business. Because, I mean, because it is to them and it's not to him. Uh, yeah, right. I mean, the movie does end up with a little bit of um, of a "Where did the flies feel" at the end, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with the spears. Mm -hmm. Also, kind of, uh, I didn't go back and look, but it sort of mimics the taking down the mammoth lesson that they had earlier in class. Yes. Too. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. See, I'm remembering a little bit of this. <laughs> I mean, the cinematography is beautiful. It shows how big and how alone they are at the same well, time. It's I, a different kind of isolation. I bought the Criterion version of this, Blu-ray of this last year on Black Friday, and I had not watched it since I, I bought it. And I probably hadn't seen this movie in a good 10 years anyway. But it is beautiful. And you're talking about the cinematography just and, and the isolation just as they're going through the like driving out in this emptiness down the road getting to and from the orphanage like to whatever next you know whatever village or town so they can get the money or resources for something. It's, oh, yeah, some of those shots are amazing. But, you know, I, I like that even very, it seems like, I mean, it's a lot of practical effects, even though there is some CGI, but it's a good use of practical effects. And they, the CGI has aged well. Oh, you know. this makes me want to watch it again. <laughs> <laughs> no, it really does because um, it's bringing back a lot of the stuff like how you were mentioning the isolation. Uh, it's such a perfect metaphor of how these kids are. They're completely isolated out in the middle of nowhere. They have nothing because they are considered nothing. They're orphanages. I mean, they're orphanages. They're orphans who live in an orphanage. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, yeah, and, and that's something that uh, Del Toro has in, in anything that I've seen of his, even down to the vampire series that was on TV for a while. Mm -hmm. The usage of of scenery and how he ties it all into a story, and you know, kind of like kind of giving you ideas of what's coming next by just showing you these beautiful shots uh, a little bit kind of like um, I have to say, you know, Steinbeck used to do the same thing, mm -hmm. you know, and, and this guy, I, I love Guillermo del Toro. Anything that he has done has never disappointed. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, and with this, there are like sweeping shots that will so that one scene will flow seamlessly into another scene like the camera is starting to move left and then all of us and it, and then it's slowing in it like moving almost like in a panoramic view into a next room and like what is happening simultaneously in another part of the orphanage or something, you know, it, 
or into like a flashback or something. It it's these kind of interesting cuts between scenes where it's almost like the lines are blurred. Um, it's not like a sharp cut between scenes, and I like that here in the it, it really works here because when you are dealing with a ghost story and sometimes the you know you're even having wait a minute am i speaking to a person or a ghost like near the end where it's kind of like who has died and who hasn't and am i speaking to their ghost or am i speaking to that actual person um you know kind of near near the end and the grand takedown um and i like that the movie opens and ends with this whole monologue and question of what is a ghost a tragedy condemned to repeat itself time and again tying in with the whole war metaphor exactly yeah. exactly and and that ties in so well with uh mexican gothic because that's that's basically what the doyles were mm -hmm. well and it goes to their crest of the snake eating its own tail mm -hmm. yeah it's mind explodes right there everybody <laughs> yeah <laughs> All the connections and more at the VD clinic. There you go. Pretty much. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I feel like I didn't have as much to say about the movie um, as I did the book, but because I feel somewhat like there is a, the way that they tie together. It's almost like, well, we've already said this about the book. <laughs> and there and it's very and there's some certain similarities there there are certain you know there are a lot of like similarities with the the two the movie and the book but uh you know what else is in the movie is is kind of like these different questions of yeah the horrors of war and you know uh, <sighs> how people respond to different how, differently to tragedies i right. mean uh uh dr shit what's his name savares casares and casares and carmen they're trying to help people you know, they've got friends on the front. They're stitching people up. They're watching after these kids. And then there's people that are responding to the same tragedies uh, like Jacinto yeah. does. And he's just looking out for himself. Fuck anybody else. I mean, he'll kill a kid. He'll well, do whatever. He even, he even killed Conchita that he supposedly cared about. and but, focused on yeah like and, virgil and, focused on what's in the walls yeah and how to um reach that next level of i don't know uh, eternal life i guess you could say it or, or just returning King, a prince without a kingdom, or whatever the yeah on the back of the scripture <laughs> said. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying, yeah, and agreeing with you, ladies, a lot. Uh, but <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> yeah, and um, I guess the both the, the the isolationism of both stories, the isolate the the isolation of these that's... kids being out in the middle of nowhere. And then the whole isolationist uh, ideals of the Doyles. 
also tie in together with this because eventually it is their downfall. Right. It's kind of like, it, and yeah, that's like Ragnarok. It's, it's, it's a snake eating its own tail. Eventually, it's going to get to the end. So, yeah. It's it's a good, good picks. Yeah, I, um, no, this is really, this was really good. And, I'm, and I was glad that I thought about kind of pairing the two and, and I'm glad I finally rewatched this because it's uh, it's it's just vi- yeah visually stunning and then I feel like there it the way it is just very poetic the way that it looks at a lot of yeah the horrors of war alone but um well and, and again, is, likes poetry he, he's memorizing poems and uh, telling them to to carmen right yeah yeah he might have been know. writing some too maybe listening to his gramophone or whatever that thing was called i know <laughs> i was jealous of vitrola Oh, the Vitrola. Isn't that what it is? It's a Vitrola. A Vitrola. And it's it's the the crank, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. No electricity. Nope. Yeah. My dad has one of those Edison wax cylinder things. Oh, no way. Yeah. But, uh, for some, I mean, he didn't even make us stay away from it when we were kids, but uh, fortunately, none of us, my sisters and I, none of us broke anything, but it still works. I mean, five, ten years ago, at least, uh, was the last time I definitely know it still worked. Uh, but yeah, uh, we ripped, uh, we recorded one of the old ones for the beginning of one of my band's CDs when we were in high school, because we just thought it was so cool. And um uh, yeah, I think he's going to donate it to some museum when he dies. Oh, that'd be cool, man. Trying That's... to buy it. And he's like, nope. It's mine. Yeah, it's mine until I die. He won't even give it to us. I think he definitely said he's given it to, to somebody that'll take care of it better or something like that, but in a nicer <laughs> way. But that is not what Casares had. That would have been harder to carry around the orphanage. But yeah, just a little. That's true. So, recommend the movie as well, obviously. Maybe. Oh, yes. Yes, most definitely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So much recommended. I'm going to go sit and watch it now. <laughs> <laughs> Another rewatch. Yeah. That would be Zora drinking my water. In the background. <laughs> Every burn. I, I apologize. Zora has his own water sitting right here. In a glass. Just like mine. And we'll usually drink it. But then all of a sudden it's like. No yours just is going to be better than mine. Oh my god. <laughs> I think might be as bad as a child. <laughs> oh they are. <laughs> Anyway, well, on that note, um, well, thank you, Iris. Um, oh, thank you, guys. I mean, um, like I said, I usually don't get much chance to uh, discuss books in such a deep and lengthy way. So uh, thank you so much for indulging. Well, I'm glad that yeah. you were able to join thank us. Thank you for coming. And, and I'm glad you like read the book. People while, yeah. <laughs> And while and people are being it. recorded, we like to ask if, if you would come back sometime. That way you feel oh. more pressure to say yes. Most <laughs> definitely. And this time I'll watch the movie. And <laughs> not just read the book. <laughs> and this time I'll make sure I communicate better. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, th- this has been great. And, um, you know, Darren actually got to 
meet and, and talk with you. That's pretty awesome too. And Vanessa, you know, we've always, you know, going back and forth on, on, on either Facebook or something, but being right. able to sit like this and talk is just yep. fabulous. So thank you. Thank you very much for having me on. Of course. And thank you for being here. Um, yeah, thank and you, you again, it was, it was nice. where, you want to, one final plug again. Yeah. Okay. So again, you know, we uh, mostly on BBNBC and that is at exploitationfilm.com. Check okay. us out there. We also have a Facebook uh, group called BBNBC. Um, and then there is the Cinema Beef podcast, which I will be doing a couple giallos tomorrow. And uh, yeah, you can just find us, you know, find me there if you want to listen to me ramble on about movies. That's part of Legion. Yes, it is. It is part of Legion. Great. Awesome. Well, we will let you go then. And then Darren and I will wrap up the show. Okay. Oh, all right. Thank you very much, y'all. And um, Thank you. yeah. Thank you. Just give me a heads up when it's ready and I'll just pimp it out. Of course. Awesome. All right. So, Have a good night, y'all. Okay. You too. Bye. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. Hey, Andrew. Hey, Maddie. Do you like horror movies? I sure do. Well, did you know that most horror movies are inspired by real-life horror? Really? Like what? Well, take The Shining, for instance. That's based on Stephen King's real-life addictions, or The Purge, which could be our country any minute now. Oh, and The Strangers, which is based on a real-life murder. People should be talking about these things. Hey, Guys. Oh, oh, hey, Producer, producer Michael. Producer Michael, oh, hi. Well, I hate to break it to you, but somebody already is. It's you. <gasps> That's right. We are Friday the 13th, the podcast where we talk about horror in real life and horror in media, all from an LGBTQ perspective. Because we gay, y'all. We are proud members of the Legion Podcast Network, and we can be found on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or wherever your favorite podcasts are found. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Come along with us on this crazy journey, and as always, get slayed. So, Darren, um, tell us, what are we doing next month? Or tell me, what am I doing next month? <laughs> All right. Next month, we or are... Or do we need a break so you can think about this? <laughs> oh, no. I I actually made up my mind before okay. we recorded. I didn't even spend any time working, uh, looking stuff up. Uh, during the recording, which I think last time I was still like checking shit mm -hmm. out. Like, wait, yeah. wait, wait, whatever. Okay, so it's November. It will be the November episode, right? So we are doing Tank Girls Giving. Oh! Shit! Or Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Uh, we're going to do the movie, and we may read some of the comic. The movie is not based on any specific comics uh, yeah. issues. They did later on make an adaptation comic of the movie, but I don't really see the point. That would be like covering Alien and the novelization of Alien. It's yeah. just not as much. So, yeah, we are doing Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. That sounds pretty fucking awesome. Thank you. Uh, I mean, we've been bouncing around the idea of doing that movie at some point since, I don't know if it was before I joined the show, but it, definitely our first brainstorm Yeah. was, we'll get to this sometime. And... Yeah, I've been th I've been thinking about that too. Um and a fun fact that I just I I recently learned. So of course, you know, Ice T that we all love and know is in that movie as one of the rippers. Yeah, yes. Well, and he's on Law and Order SVU. Another guy that was on Law and Order SVU, I think, like in a, a handful of episodes, um, appeared as one of the Rippers. 
<laughs> yes. I know. I just awesome. kind of think I kind of think that's funny. And yeah, so seemed like no better time to do it. And sure. I was a little high and I was like, tanks. Why me. not? That's but I didn't know if that was kind of dad jokey, but I mean I'm there for it. All right. <laughs> I'm there for dad jokes because I am a child of Laffy Taffy. There we and go. Those, the Bazooka and Joe. Those, and those, yeah, and those jokes on the bomb pops, like popsicle sticks. Oh. The ones, the uh, the popsicle sticks that are red, white, and blue are called bomb pops. At least the ones That's where right. I grew up, and those had jokes like that too. Once you got down to the stick. <laughs> I think they even had jokes like that on the back of Garbage Pail Kids, but they were, yeah, I don't know. It's been a minute. Very anyway, cool. Vanessa, uh, do you have anything to pimp out before we go? Um, not that I can think of right now. You know, but... Occasionally in October's, you would guess spot, but you've been a very busy person. Um, I know it's, it seems like this year there's just some different people have had other stuff on their agendas and they haven't even been doing as many episodes as usual. So, you know, I kind of feel like this year, everybody's just hard, well, I don't, you know, just not putting out as much, but stuff, but all good. Um, and it's all good if I don't guess too, because sometimes, I mean, I, I've got a lot going on myself just with work so you know how it goes but anywho um what else do you have going on oh uh um, psycho semanticast or anywhere else yeah psycho semanticast as usual uh, i think that's about it uh very well yeah people are probably caught up with that so i just finished up my podcast under the stairs summer series thing but that was at the end of September. But I think he put out three episodes that were four and a half hours longer or four and a half hours long or longer as the last three roundtables for that. So there very well could be people still listening to it. Uh, I am on, I think, the first one and the shortest one. Okay, okay. If that's a seller, that's a seller for me. Uh, being on a shorter episode sure. and uh yeah so over at psycho semantic um yeah business as usual talking with people that is where i had heard of that el norte movie that you were talking about mm -hmm. yeah uh so i'm talking to some people that uh tried to unionize and got screwed out of their jobs and oh, i'm telling we're... you this this movie that was one of the it. movies that came up as a possibility uh, for that. But nothing is set in stone on that. So, you know, I mean, I don't like to say uh, specifically until I've actually recorded the episode. So okay, other shit like that. But yeah, Psychosemantic, VD Clinic are both part of the wonderful Legion podcast network. All kinds of shit coming out this month and next month and forever over, <laughs> over on there. And yeah. yeah. Uh, that's all I can think of. Okay. So sounds like yeah. sounds like a plan. Very cool. Right, yeah. Well, see y'all see yins next month. Happy spooky season. Spooky spores. This marble is with. Thank you for listening to another episode of the VD Clinic. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can find us at Twitter at VD Clinic Pod or reach us via email at VD Clinic Pod at gmail.com. We also have a Facebook group, VD Clinic Podcast. We'd love to hear your feedback, suggestions, and more.